Hello, my name is uh, Jaap van Laar. I'm editor of Rheumatology and I'm very pleased that um, Dr. Liz Price from Swindon, consultant mm -hmm. rheumatologist, is here to discuss with us the latest uh, Shogun's uh, guidelines from the BSR. Um, so, Dr. Price, uh, please tell us, what, what's the uh, latest uh, about these guidelines? Okay, so um, I've worked with a, a group of, of, of other specialists covering rheumatology, oral medicine and an eyes, plus um, an occupational therapist and patient representative, to come up with a very pragmatic mm -hmm. um, guideline that's aimed at um, your general rheumatologists and also applicable to ophthalmologists and, and oral medicine and dentists and so forth, to manage patients with Sherman syndrome. And the idea is we're offering you a very practical guide to all the things that you can do to improve the quality of life and the long-term outcomes for your patients with Sherman's. Mm -hmm. so, so what will you think is the new compared to previous so I think, guidelines? Yes, okay, so, what's the emphasis well, on the current guidelines? I think in fairness there haven't been previous guidelines and there has never been a comprehensive guideline in this way that's looked at all the different aspects of Sherman's. And one of the issues that we've come across is that um, as rheumatologists we're very used to dealing with joint disease and systemic disease but we're not really comfortable looking after eyes and mouth mm -hmm. and again if you look at the ophthalmologist they're very comfortable with the eyes but not with the rest of the body and so mm -hmm. forth and the same with the oral medicine people so the idea is that this draws together um, the sort of state-of-the-art advice on how you how you manage oral symptoms, ocular symptoms and systemic symptoms in patients with Sherbrooke's. And the idea is to try and look at starting treatment early, offering a holistic approach, um, looking at all different aspects of the disease and ultimately improving the patient's current condition and their long-term outcome and prognosis. Right. And in, in terms of systemic treatment, is, is there any... Uh, any so, mentioning of biological yes, use, for yeah, example? Yes, there is. So, so in terms of systemic treatments, um, most rheumatologists will be aware that actually there aren't that many systemic treatments with a good track record in Sherbrooke's. And in terms of biologics, there have only been the two, well, there have been lots of anecdotal studies, there have been case reports and small case series, which all look fairly encouraging, predominantly looking at rituximab. Um, there have been two larger studies, the TIERS trial in France and the TRACTUS trial in the UK, neither of which reached their primary outcome measure and neither of which um, provided any good evidence for using rituximab in these patients in general. Mm -hmm. However, um, uh, subgroup analysis is undergoing at the present time and we all feel that there are certain subgroups uh, of patients with Sherbrooke's who would benefit from biologic treatment, particularly with rituximab or similar, similar agents. And um, the, the challenge really is identifying those patients mm -hmm. and, and delivering um, care to them appropriately. So for instance, I feel, and I think this is a, a feeling echoed by many, mm -hmm. by many, many rheumatologists who mm -hmm. work in my field, that very often we're looking at patients far too late down the line. So we're all very comfortable now with treating RA early, being aggressive in the early stages, trying to modify the disease. And, and actually, I think there has been almost like a therapeutic nihilism mm -hmm. about Sherbrooke's, whereby people go, oh, you can't do very much for these patients, you know, why bother, why follow them up, why just, you know, just mm -hmm. leave them. Um, but I think that's going to change, and I mm -hmm. think um, there's now a lot of pharma interest uh, in Sherbrooke's, there are some new molecules out there, and conventional agents being looked at in more detail. And I think the challenge is going to be for the future, targeting um, the treatment to the correct patients. So mm -hmm. sorting out who actually does need biologics, who simply needs topical therapies mm -hmm. and who needs things like pilocarpine, hydroxychloroquine, the more conventional agents that yeah. do have a place yeah. in, in certain yeah. patients. Right. And, and what's your hunch in, in terms of type of patient that might benefit so from I think a biological? So I think we're looking at probably the younger patients, shorter disease duration. That is a big challenge in Sherbrooke's. Um, the studies suggest that the average disease duration before diagnosis is 10 years. Right. So right. you may have missed the boat in many yeah. of our patients. I think we are getting better at diagnosing it younger. I'm seeing more younger patients, um, particularly with you know more availability of rolar antibodies. Mm. Um, we're, we're picking up patients. I think there is a resurgence of interest in doing minor salivary gland lip biopsies. Mm. So when I was training, we did them to diagnose patients. Um, they fell out of favour for a few mm. years. I've kept on doing them, and actually we're now seeing more interest. Mm. And with some evidence that actually doing a lip biopsy allows you to look at and disease activity and possibly predict patients who are at high risk of lymphoma and progression in the future. So I think, again, it's stratifying patients mm -hmm. into groups that are more likely to benefit and targeting your mm -hmm. treatment effectively. Right. So if, if, if there's this type of delay from mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. first line to second line, there's also probably room for improvement oh, in, in, in informing GPs. So, yes, I think you're right. So I think it's education. So I think if you talk to patients about Sherbrooke's, most of them will say their dentists are pretty good. 
Dentists are pretty mm. good, opticians are not bad, GPs mm. are pretty hopeless. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that GPs are overwhelmed mm. and that Sherman's is not on the old standard G, uh, GP curriculum, if, no. you, if mm. you like. So I think what we're doing, um, it, it, you know, uh, the Sherman's related doctors are trying to look at educating the public mm. and GPs as a whole. You know, lots of people, everyone seems to have heard of lupus, mm. but actually lupus is probably less common than Sherman's. Yeah. You know, so, so it, it, that's about public awareness. Yeah. It's also about educating GPs. And, I, you know, I fully appreciate they're a hard group to get at because of the time constraints and so forth, and they're under massive pressure. But I think, hopefully, mm. with, um, you know, expanding knowledge across... Across mm. the population as a whole, these people will be picked up, and certainly um, organisations like the British Sherman's mm. Association, the BSSA, which is a patient-focused charity, is doing a lot to raise public awareness and yeah. hopefully ultimately well. raise GP awareness. Okay, well, um, mm. thank you very much to, to thank for, you. for sharing this uh, useful and practical information. I encourage all the readers to read these uh, latest uh, Sherman's guidelines. Thank you.